Ken Makreka was a leading goal scorer in 1986 from uh, Krinaka Rangers. And then he bought by Keza Chiefs that year. He got to play for Keza Chiefs. He was a marvelous to watch. Greg, I remember you very well because uh, I used to play for my team, Kaiser Chiefs, uh, which is number 14. Oh, Mshinoichi, Mshinoichi, Shinma Greg, I coached him for a He was one of the king, king of the soccer. McGregor was a soccer striker. I never find out that uh, we've got a perfect striker like a shape. Check it out for McGregor. McGregor gets that shot in the worldwide of Brian Paris goal. Uh, Nineteen eighty seven, we must come and come up on your own. Hey, Shenwa Kreka, the way I pass the ball, all niggas, my Maponian had a back kick. Chiefs are winning one deal. The, the last game we missed in Cup. And uh, the PP top eight, uh, ninety two. She came in Kumbula and Scotches of the Paranea. And then they came out like this. I think it was a great derby. Yeah, it, it was a derby. Ah, la, la, I got a player. 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 Shane, Kaiser Chiefs signed Shane. I'm a pirate supporter, but I'm talking about Shane. I remember when Shane, one day he faced former one of the pirates goalkeeper by the name of uh, Ayoba Yoba. Shane, he never looked any sight of giving another players any opportunity to score. He prepared him to do the job. Shane McGregor, eh, that's just like a cool look at it. But Shane doesn't use the map, but I'm not kidding. The team is on here for Nakita. Nakita left alone there by Soka. The Soka somehow has got back. Now Scott and Tipper. My name is Shay McGregor, um, come from the south of Johannesburg, lived there basically all my life until uh, I moved out uh, to Cape Town. Family man, uh, got two brothers and one sister, parents are unfortunately deceased at the moment but uh, you know these things happen. Uh, I've got an older sister and two older brothers so I'm the youngest of four and uh, I've got a big family as well, uh, been divorced twice. I've got uh, basically five kids, uh, three with my first wife and two with the second. I got into the game by mistake to be very honest with you, getting into soccer. Um, I was, as I said to you, the youngest of four and my brothers have been playing soccer and uh, they they weren't uh, they weren't going through with their soccer careers. I mean, they started and started off, and they just started petering out and weren't playing anymore. And uh, I was just left to my own. I wasn't uh, pushed by my parents as such. I played school at soccer. I mean, soccer at school, but uh, you know, I wasn't besides that. And one day, my uncle was running a soccer team, and he was a player short, and decided to come fetch me and take me down to the to the club and give me a run and let me play. And I got instructed at the time, just go stand up front there. When the ball comes to you, try kick it into the goals. Simple as that. And that was my first instructions as a footballer. Uh, I played my first game in school shoes. I played my second game in school shoes. But, uh, you know, obviously there was a little bit of talent there because in the first game I scored four goals. And, uh, you know, from there it just built on. I got a pair of boots and my career just built from there. I started playing a bit more regularly. Obviously at school was playing regularly and then got selected for one of the provincial teams after a year of starting to play. I might have got into soccer by default, but the, the reason why is that, you know, I'd started off and I'd scored a few goals and I'd done fairly well and that was all part and parcel, you know, once you're successful in something and once you start enjoying it, you're going to go progress and want to do it and, and that's what happened with me is I started playing, as I said, you scored a couple of goals in the first game 
and it just progressed from there where yeah the football at that stage the soccer wasn't at the best level but uh, you know I had a, a knack of scoring goals and got my first pair of boots and it just went from there I played there I played at school as I said I got provincial colors at, from school which then went into provincial club as a club level and I moved from one of this from this very small club to Robertsham uh, Kelly's which was at the time Robertsham which was a really big club uh, and that's how it all developed was uh, from there I was playing elite soccer, um, you're playing in provincial at Southern Transvaal and that type of thing and at that stage when I was probably about 14, 15 I decided that I wanted to try and make a go of this and you know at that stage every player's dream was to go play overseas and unfortunately for a lot of players they couldn't do that and obviously that was my dream as well and I just pursued it and worked hard at it. I went and trained at a club for three months, a certain club uh, in the local area in Joburg uh, it was being run by Mark Kenny as a coach and I trained for them for three months, a friend of mine Gary Matthews as well, we both decided that we're going to do this together, we both come from Robertsham and we trained for three months at Wits um, and at the end of the three months, just before the season was starting, uh, we were called aside by Mr Kenny and saying, uh, listen guys, you're very good amateur footballers, you're never going to make the grade of professional, so I'd rather go back and go play your amateur football. So it was a bit of a, a letdown for us at the time. But uh, lo and behold, two days later, we got a phone call from Mr. Des Bacchus, who was at Kronika Rangers at the time with Alex Forbes, and said, look, we've heard about you two guys. Would you like to come down and have a look and have a train with us and see where we are? And let's take it from there. And that's where the big break came from. I went down to, to Kronika Rangers in Mayfair, myself and Gary. We trained two training sessions, uh, and we were signed there and then. Uh, we were signed on the, on, this, on the third day. We were signed up um, and said, uh, you know, let's see what you can do and, and that's how I came around. So I went and signed for Granica Rangers, I was earning a huge 250 rand a month, 50 rand a point and I was quite happy with life, I was a professional player as such. Langeschein McGregor in the first year we were runners up in the league and I was very surprised, I thought we went down first year professional, this is an easy game, this is very easy, look at the second, first year in your professional and runners up in the league, Bushbucks beat us in the league that year and it was just a matter of down to team effort and, and the world to win. Uh, and the following year, you know, that, that was the biggest memory for me at Rangers is we went on and won the league. Uh, we got up there and we got the job done. Uh, once again, played hard, our hearts out. Uh, we got one or two players in and we had one or two loanies in from Chiefs. Uh, Wellington Mignotti was one of them. And it all helped to build our team into, into a match winning team. And that's what happened. And for me, that's the greatest achievement for me at Granica Rangers was going on and winning the league. Uh, not, not winning goal scorer of the year or anything like that, was winning the league with Rangers. Just shows that a small team can do it and uh, a so-called uh, small amateur team as such can do it. Transition to Chiefs came about by obviously playing against them and, and be playing them in the league and beating them and, and getting results against them, you know, and scoring goals against them and that type of thing. And obviously you must leave a lasting impression of that. You know, with a lot of clubs, not just the Chiefs, uh, you, know, you had the bigger clubs, you had Swallows, you had a few others, you know, and uh, obviously they were interested and that's how Chiefs came about is obviously I played against them and scored a good couple of goals and they liked what they'd seen. Um, this man can score and he knows where the back of the net is and I think that's what interested them in the beginning. But it's all about the hard work as well, you know, the, the, the guys behind it and I was lucky enough to be playing in a good team then and, and we were scoring a lot of goals and I was the main goal scorer and that helped me, that helped me get uh, promoted to Chiefs as such. I wasn't going to go there first. I had another destination, which was Solas. But Chiefs came in at the last minute and I signed for them. Playing for Chiefs was a huge eye-opener for me in the beginning. I must be very honest with you. I went down and to be very fair and honest, I was lucky I had a decent coach in Jeff Butler. Um, this is a, a family on his show, so I can't exactly tell you exactly what he said to me the first day I went down to training. But it was a punch in the stomach and told me I'm fat. I need to go do laps go run. And I looked at him and I was taken aback. I was a top goal scorer. I'm coming for Euro as a soccer club uh, that I was at. And he has this man punch him in the stomach and tell him I'm fat. I must go run. So I did that for two to three weeks. I did laps. Just ran around while the guys were training. And eventually uh, I, I 
called Mr. Matuang and said, I need a meeting with you. Um, I need to discuss this. And he's, his answer to me was, he's the coach, speak to him. And I was too scared to go speak to Jeff Butler at the stage. But anyway, long story short, I had a chat to him. But luckily, in hindsight, he, he did that to me. I'll tell you why. It's because, you know, you go to a big club, there's expectations of you coming in and, and you expected to be scoring and firing straight away. And if I'd gone and for the first three or four weeks there were no goals, I would have the supporters up against my back. This way, at least, um, it, I could go and, you know, and can settle in and slowly but surely get my own rhythm gain and get myself playing. And that's what happened. And I was very lucky that we had a decent coach to do that. So for me, I had a nice little upbringing into it, but it was an eye-opener. There were a little bit of other things that uh, I hadn't experienced before, but uh, we all know it's uh, all part and parcel of, of the South African game. Some of the moments I remember, you know, winning cups, winning leagues, going out there and playing. But, you know, for me, the, the best part of it all was just the camaraderie we had and the training and the hard work we put into it. Uh, that was one thing about the Chiefs cars. We had a team of stars, but they all worked hard and we all worked hard together. Shane McGregor, Mamba Bwale, Sandler, the Pantra Goma Tarabuz, Lengaku, Lise Nubwalia, Drew Pass, Entega Kulupaya, Bwale and O'Neill Telvi, some people to linesmen, Quella Tal to play on, Uzu Jonge, Ushane McGregor, Claire Ebon Ba Upwalia, Usene Ubetega, Paya, Palinanga, Fige Polini. Well, the nickname, uh, the, the naming of the nickname, I don't know how it came about. I mean, obviously, I did have this big gold chain in the old days, you know, it looked, uh, it was part and parcel of uh, the 80s then. So it was having these big gold chains that you had around your neck. Like today's guys, they buy their cars, their fancy cars. We had the gold chains around the neck, and that was part of it. And, Baketan, I suppose, came about that uh, that way. I, I was told one story, and that's the other story was about the gold chain, and the other one was the, the Maketan knew, I supposedly was the link between the defence and the, the strikers. Uh, this is what they were telling me. So I don't know which is the real story, but uh, one or two, they must be true. But yeah, I've got called Maketan. I think it's a little bit better than Makuku, but anyway. I'm at the peak of my career, get a call up for the national team and obviously you want to go play, everyone wants to play for the national team, which I duly did, you know, they had the, the, the series against Cameroon before which I wasn't included in, uh, now this is the first official game where we're playing against Zimbabwe, so I get the call up and, and go to the national training camp, which I did, so off we go to Zimbabwe, uh, for me, I'm straightforward, uh, I, uh, this is the way I see it and I'll say it the way I see it. And we were training uh, just, before the far, uh, just before the game, the week before the game, and we were training in a specific way where Phil Masinga was playing up front of myself. We both had similar attributes where we can hold the ball up, bring players into the game, which we were playing to our strengths. And we were training that way the whole week, uh, had the wide guys up docked and all that running and knocking the balls off and playing off us. So anyway, we, we trained the whole week. The Friday night before the game, they have an official function in the City Hall for both teams. Uh, we go and meet the players, we go and meet the management. You know, it's all, a, a, not a social thing, but just a, a matter of courtesy. And the coach decided to have a look at their team. Uh, Mr. Shanghai at the time was playing there, and I think the, the fans will know Mr. Shanghai from Cape Town Spurs. Uh, he wasn't the tallest man in the world, but he had a, huge jump on him, he could outjump most players. So the night, that night, uh, our coach decided that we're going to be changing the game plan. The morning of the game, he comes in and says, this is the way we're going to play. Let's knock a long ball to Phil and Shane, and we'll play off that. So I stood up straight away and I said to him, coach, number one, that's not my strength. I said, I'm not brilliant in the air. I'm not going to be able to chase the balls of Phil Masinga because I'm, uh, I'm not a quick player. So why are we doing this and why are we changing the game? He says, no, I saw their players there yesterday, they're all short. This is the way we can beat them. This is the way to change it. I said, but we've trained this way the whole week. So anyway, you know, you don't do that with coaches. We play the game as well as we had to wear a specific make of boots for the game, which I was very unhappy with because I had a sponsor of boots. So in half time, I came in and took my boots off, uh, the sponsored boots, chucked them in and put my own sponsored boots on. And I said, coach, you've got to change the way we're playing. We're getting murdered out so I think we were 2 0 down at half time. Uh, five minutes into the second half, he pulled me off, and that was my career over as a, as a Bafana player, because a year later I got myself injured. I basically uh, uh, tore my cruciate ligaments, and I, I tore the ligaments in my, my knee and the cartilage, and 
we're playing the African Cup game and it happened against Al Ahli at, at FNB and I was badly injured so I was out for a year out of football uh, while they're trying to get my knee right. The doctor at the time said to me I must give up football, uh, I'll never be able to play again so you know it was one of those things. I was at Chiefs uh, and they were just they were just starting to become fully professional. Trucio was there uh, as the coach and he wanted to train twice a day, sometimes three times a day and I couldn't at that stage. I mean my knee wasn't up to it and number one and number two I was working a full-time job which most of us were anyway so the transition came about Terry Payne for me. He said uh, Supersport are interested in buying a club uh, they're going to be taking over Pretoria City. Would I be interested in coming to play for them? Uh, I jumped at the chance. I said to him, look, this is the situation. I put my cars up front that the knee's not 100%. Let's just give it a go and see what happens. And he said, look, we've got a bigger future plan, here. Let's just look at it and see what happens. And that's how I moved to Pretoria City was my knee was, was basically nearly finished. Uh, I went into Kaiser and I said, look, Kaiser, this is the situation. I'm never going to be able to play at the level I was let me move on and he kindly enough uh, let me go for a nominal fee to Pretoria City uh, through uh, Terry Payne and, and that's how that started. Uh, he took over, uh, played six months at Pretoria City and unfortunately we got relegated that season but for the last three or four games Terry became the coach, uh, they fired Stan Lapotte, he became the coach and I was his assistant uh, and, and as I say unfortunately he got relegated to the first division but it was the start of things to come. Uh, the following season, Terry decided once again he's going to do the coaching and I'll be the assistant coach, which didn't quite work out because after two weeks of travelling to Pretoria, he decided that this is not for him and he put me in charge and, you know, I just took over the team. Very, uh, very difficult, you know, being a youngster still and, and also still being a still player coach, but uh, survived it and, and that's how we got through and uh, that, that year was super sport. We won the league, uh, the first division, we were unbeaten that whole season. In actual fact, we got beaten once that whole year was in the, the cup final where uh, we got beaten, uh, I think it was Captain Spurs beat us in the cup final. So, the yeah, Bob's had cup final, that's the only time we got defeated the whole year and got promoted into the Premier League. It's interesting for Shane to become a coach at Babylon Sundowns, uh, even though he didn't uh, stay for long uh, due to certain circumstances, but uh, quickly he was slapped by Supersport. Uh, I remember Supersport, he was a player coach, so he was also assisted by the late Madi, uh, Thomas Madikach. So, and then when Thomas uh, recommended me to Shane because I had a problem at the uh, Pirate by then. Player coach is the most difficult job that there is in football and I'll tell you why I say that is that you're looking at it from a player's point of view and you're looking at it from a coaching point of view so you can't have friends as, as, as players you, you've got to be their boss but at the same time you've got to get the best out of them and you've got to be playing with them so for me that was the most difficult job ever I started off as the playing quite a bit and then I started slowly but surely just benching myself, coming on when I needed to, playing a lot less because it was a little bit easier and I had to trust in my players as well. So the only way to do that was to basically bench myself and let them do the job and only, only be played in emergencies. But it was a very difficult job, you know, no matter what anyone says, it's the most difficult job I think there is in football as a player coach. That's why you don't see it often anymore. I don't think you, you get it anymore. I haven't seen it in any clubs. It's very, very difficult. You've got to concentrate on one or the other. But we got away with it for a year uh, before I finally decided that uh, enough was enough and uh, you know, I gave up. Uh, but it was a very difficult first year. Edward was having problems at Pride, so we decided uh, let's move for him. I mean, he was a great player, a very big character, and unique characters in the change room. And for me, that's, that's one of the big things is you need those characters and Eddie is definitely one of those, you know. So, as we said, having the problem, he wanted to move on, and we offered him a position, and uh, yeah, we had our discussions with him, and money talks, uh, obviously, and we had a lot of money at that stage. But not just that for me, for me it was the character in the change room, you know. For me, you've got to have that. You've got to have the play people in the change rooms, changing the guys' attitudes, and he could definitely do that, you know. He's joking around, but knew when to be serious. And he was a quality player, so we had to bring him in. Uh, and eventually, you know, he, he did a great job for us. So it wasn't just him, there were a few others. Uh, 
Uh, I'm trying to think of them a bit. Gardner Siali we brought in from Chiefs. Uh, we, we brought players in from different clubs. Gardner was the one. Uh, Tommy Marakhi. Tommy was, had come back from overseas and was looking for a club and we made him off, he couldn't refuse. And the transition from Supersport to Sundance came about. Uh, there was a big changes at Supersport. They had a look at things and they wanted to change the, the whole aspect of the club, the way they were looking. And they decided that it was time for me to move on, which is fair, that happens in all football clubs and it, it happens all around the world. Um, I left them, I got out of football for a short while before I went to Sundowns. I got a call from Mr. Mr. Chickless, not uh, Mrs. Chickless, Mr. Chickless phoned me and said, listen, can we have a discussion, can we have a coffee, we both live in the south, we got this club Sundowns, come and talk to us, we're very interested in your services. So we met up and that's how it came about initially was uh, Ted Dimitri was the coach of the club at the time and they wanted someone to help Ted. Ted had no help at the, in the coaching department and I think he preferred that that way, to be very honest with you. Uh, but I had the meeting with them and uh, Natasha signed me up uh, the next day and I uh, became the assistant coach. For the first couple of weeks I was left out in the cold again, uh, very similar feeling to the Chiefs thing, he just ignored me completely. Um, until we had this big discussion and I told him, I'm not off to your job, all I'm here is I want to come and help and I want to be part of it, I want to just uh, lessen your load you know, and help you along and eventually that's how it all turned around. Uh, I, I stayed with them for a year and a half but uh, with Ted it was difficult up front but he was a good coach, I mean, he knew what was going on and he, he taught me quite a lot in, in that position and I'm grateful for that. But uh, yeah, we, I was there for a year, Victor Bondarenka came along and eventually once again, you know, that, that big uh, silver boot came out and I got given the boot out of the club. I just decided to get out of football altogether. Uh, you know, life is history from there. I just gave up on the football, I stopped doing everything. Until 2029, 20, I got offered a position at Umbro to come in as a, as a brand manager at, at Umbro in Cape Town and uh, do the, their sales and do their sales as a sales manager, come brand manager. In 2010, after I've been working for Umbro, um, I got given the opportunity of doing the soccer betting show for uh, Pumalela to Teletrack and uh, I jumped at the chance. I mean, it's a passion of mine. Uh, I'm a little bit of a gambler. I'm not a big, big punter and big gambler, but I'm a little bit of punter and doing the soccer made it even better. So life has been good for me in this aspect of it because I've got a lot of free time now. Uh, I do my shows every morning. So I spend an hour or two hours a day doing my shows. And then I've got a lot of free time you know, to be able to do things like this uh, and to be able to go play golf and do the, the things I want to do. So in closing, I, I just want to give a word out there to those youngsters out there today in, in today's football. Um, you know, they've got to go out there and start working harder. For me, there's no substitute for hard work. And I, you know, I've been around the, the block, I've seen it. I put in extra work because I knew I had to. I was the Mulungu, I had to prove myself. I had to work extra harder than the players that had more skill than me. I did that and I did it for no other reason that I wanted to succeed. So for me, for the youngsters out there, go out there, work hard. The harder you work, the easier it becomes. The harder you work, the more rewards you're going to get. And you know, that, that's the big thing in life.